Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Isam Nassar, for joining us, uh, joining me today, and uh, thanks for accepting this invitation to uh, to do this uh, interview. Uh, I'm just going to uh, introduce you quickly to uh, um, to those who uh, are listening. Um, uh, Professor Isam Nassar is a Palestinian historian uh, at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies, uh, specializing in the history of the Middle East, uh, especially Palestine, um, and the history of photography. He has done extensive research on, journal uh, on Jerusalem in particular, and for our purposes here, I'm just going to mention three of his books, uh, photograph uh, Photographing Jerusalem, The Image of the City in 19th Century Photography, uh, different Snapshots, Early Local Photography in Palestine, and uh, Karima Aboud, Pioneer of Feminist Photography in Palestine. Uh, Isam Nassar is also co-editor of uh, Jerusalem Quarterly. Um, so again, thank you for, for joining us um, in uh, this, what is, I guess, a, a very important moment in the history of Palestine and, and the history of our region. Um, with uh, attacks on Gaza, uh, pogroms in Palestinian communities in Haifa, Yaffa, Akka, and elsewhere in 48 Palestine, uh, the imminent forced expulsion of families from occupied Jerusalem, and the uprisings in the West Bank being met with live fire, uh, and, uh, um, and also and live fire from the Israelis and, and repression from the PA uh, at some level. Um, so it's, uh, it's really important to understand how this latest intifada, uh, this uprising began, and uh, from where, I guess, it began in, uh, in Jerusalem. Um, so I wanted to uh, ask you, um, we'll start with sort of a little bit broader and then get into uh, Sheikh Jarrah, because I'd love to hear your, your, your sort of uh, explanation of, uh, of what's going on there. Um, but to get there, and before we do, I, I wanted to ask you to explain to us a little bit about the process of Israeli colonization in Jerusalem and what people call the Judaization of uh, Jerusalem. Um, and then we can maybe uh, focus in on uh, Sheikh Jarrah uh, from, from there, if, if you like. Okay, sounds great. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for this invitation. I'm honored and thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, let me just start with uh, uh, right into your question. Um, of course, the, the start for all of this is that we, you know, just briefly need to always keep in mind is Zionism. Zionism, since its inception, was an exclusive uh, movement, a movement that only saw that Jews have certain rights, that they are different from others, and then when it chose Palestine for a variety of reasons, the Palestine was not the only option at the time, uh, it basically completely ignored the fact that Palestine was inhabited by people who had their own uh, wishes and uh, uh, for, for a better future uh, and desires for uh, whether independence or independence in a larger uh, country at the time. So from its uh, the beginning of the Zionist colonization in Palestine, Zionists tended to build exclusive Jewish communities. The first communities in Palestine were uh, colonies, or most of them were kibbutzes. Uh, they were built on land at the time purchased from rich landlords or absentee landlords, after, especially after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, and the owners were now either Syrian or Lebanese or Turks or whatever it is, so they were selling. So, uh, but these communities from the beginning were exclusive. In fact, they were closed by barbed wire. There were uh, guards at the gates, people who, uh, peasants mostly at the time it was in rural areas, peasants who used to work the land, lived on the land or uh, regularly crossed, uh, such as let's say, um, shepherds who crossed in the in the area were banned were shot at so from the very beginning there was no place for the non-jews particularly non-zionists non-members non or, or devotees to the zionist idea to even be part of the landscape and this continued 
of course, with the building of the Jewish uh, uh, colonial project in Palestine under the mandate, and it continued immediately uh, after uh, the issue of Palestine came to the UN, and the UN in 1947 partitioned Palestine into two states, uh, proposed a partition of Palestine into two states and one uh, international entity uh, around Jerusalem. Uh, the reason I bring this up is the, although the UN envisioned in the partition plan that there will be two states with open borders and uh, one currency and, uh, you know, it, it was just about states. It did not envision that people will be moved from one place to the next, expelled from one place to the next. Immediately Zionism, based on that plan, this is even before the declaration, of the establishment of the State of Israel, attempted to empty the territories that would have been, according to the plan, a Jewish state from its non-Jewish inhabitants, from Palestinian inhabitants. And we start a process uh, of basically ethnic cleansing of Palestinians from that area. And this is all from like uh, end of 1947 up to the uh, official declaration of the establishment of the state in 48, in May 48. Then we have the uh, establishment of the state and the war that took place at the time in which eventually the uh, Zionist state or the new state of Israel was uh, gained more territories than it was supposed to gain uh, to have under the UN partition plan. And therefore the uh, ethnic cleansing continued and now with official cover, it was the Israeli army and uh, that was basically moving, forcing out Palestinians or those Palestinians who fled during the war were prevented by the army from returning. Therefore, the uh, Israel as it emerged in its borders by let's say early 1950s was largely uh, Jewish in terms of population with small pockets of Palest this mostly displaced, not all, but mostly displaced Palestinians within its own borders. Even those who were not on their land at the time uh, <clears throat> were uh, not allowed to return to it. So the policy was to make sure everything is only for the benefit of the Jewish people. This is in line with the Declaration of Independence that Israel is the state of the Jewish people. Of course, there is a problem with that, that we don't know what is the Jewish people. Who are these people? It's not the state of the Jews in Palestine. It's the state of some vague uh, concept of the Jewish people. So any Jew in the world, has, is uh, that is his state in, in their perspective. And it's not the state of the people who live in it or a state of its own citizens. And er early on in the 1950s, the property of the displaced Palestinians who became refugees, whether in the neighboring Arab countries or, or in what's left in, uh, in Palestine, like East Palestine, which would be renamed into the West Bank or uh, like um, uh, the uh, area around Gaza, which we now call the Gaza Strip, which fell to, to Egyptian control at the time. Uh, the Palestinian, their property, the those displaced Palestinians was all placed in the hands of a newly established uh, governmental body called the guardian of absentee property. And that guardian or that office basically took over these lands and uh, uh, basically erased in most cases, about in, in most, not you know, there are few exceptions in, in, in cities, but in most cases erased any evidence that there was a village here uh, through a project of demo demolition and forestation, basically building forests in, in places where villages used to be, or, be, or simply building a new colony, uh, Zionist colony in, in that place. So the very, uh, I'm bringing this up all because it is essential. It's part of the, the very vision of Zionism to exclude everyone. Now the problem, uh, well, I mean, it's all a problem, but then, Another problem is that you have holy places in Palestine, places that are holy to three uh, major religions in the world, to the three Abrahamic religions. And a city like Jerusalem, and among others, 
uh, was contested specially because according to the UN plan, it was supposed to be a separate entity, the corpus separatum that is open to everyone, although it fell according to that plan within the territories of the proposed Arab state. Uh, it is in that context that, uh, you know, a city like this could have been a symbol for religious unity and practice. But the Zionist idea from the beginning was to make this city an exclusive Jewish city, a symbol of Judaism, therefore a symbol of the state in itself. So immediately in 1948, about a month to month, starting in, in March and April 1948 and continuing into 49, the Zionist organizations and then the state uh, of Israel uh, expelled or forced out most of the Palestinians who lived in the parts of Jerusalem that came under its control. And those include uh, the Western suburbs of Jerusalem, like Al Baqa, Al Talbiya, Al Qatamon, and other places, um, from which around 30,000 Palestinians were expelled, and most of them moved, uh, were moved to the Arab sec section of the city. By Arab section, I mean the section that fell under Arab control or remained under Arab control at that time, which is what we call today East Jerusalem. Following 1967 and Israel's occupation of the entire city, Israel attempted immediately to take steps in which it will make the Jewish presence in the city the majority. And, uh, the, and that was achieved gradually through a number of things. One of them is creating a new category of, uh, of Palestinian residents in the city uh, you know, Palestinians were already divided between refugees and those who lived in, in the West Bank uh, with Jordanian citizenship, those who lived in Gaza, etc., and those who lived in the Galilee who became, or, or in the coastal areas who became Israeli citizens. Um, <clears throat> they invented a new residency category for Palestinians who were living in the city. When Israel arrived, they were in the city and their, their grandparents and ancestors always lived in the city, all of a sudden they were turned into residents only rather than citizens. And they became an, uh, a group that has only the right to reside, but not to be part of any political process. And the same laws were applied in which, uh, you know, again, we go back to the laws from 1950s of confiscating property, and, and uh, the same, those laws started to be applied in the sense that they, uh, the Israeli government was looking for any area in which a Jewish person or persons lived at some point and were now claiming that this is a Jewish property or property of the Jewish people. This even happened during the Six Day War or the 1967 war, before the war was over, the Israelis already demolished the Maghribi quarter of the old city, which is adjacent to the uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock, and next to the Wailing Wall or what Muslims call Al-Buraq Wall or what Jews call the Western Wall, uh, in order to uh, make an esplanade to celebrate the victory. and. Uh, so basically people were removed, Palestinians who lived in that, that area were removed from their homes and placed either in the refugee camps around the city or in, in, in some neighborhoods like uh, Ram, for example, north of the, the city. So already the, uh, the process of making sure that the city is only or mostly inhabited by Jews and that the religious sites of non-Jews are less important. When they demolish the Maghribi quarter, they demolish mosques that were built in the 13th century there without any concern for that. They of course took over the, what they call the Western wall or al Barak wall, uh, which used to be a Muslim property and a shared space for prayer and turned it immediately into only an exclusive Jewish holy site. The same with a number of other religious sites, including the tomb of uh, Prophet David or King David, which was a mosque 
and uh, outside of Jerusalem we see it with Rachel's tomb used to be a mosque open for everyone, Christian Jews and Muslims. And this continues. So there is a vision, an exclusive vision, basically to, to put it in a nutshell, that uh, what matters is only what is relevant to Jewish history and tradition. And the other element of it, whatever is, was Jewish or owned or, or, or uh, by a Jew becomes a heritage and the property of the Jewish people in general, thus the state. And the other thing is there is a, a clear attempt to make all of Palestine, of course, particularly Jerusalem, a symbol only of Judaism in some sense, which will uh, emphasize their desire to make it into the, uh, uh, the united eternal capital of Israel. And that is only possible by removing non-Jews. And there are all sorts of examples, but I, I think I don't want to, we don't have time to get into specifics in this sense. Yeah, no, th this is, uh, this is great. And it, it really, I think, takes us up to uh, the, you know, uh, the neighborhood of uh, Sheikh Jarrah and, and what's going on there, because, uh, you know, you, you sort of, uh, I think this is probably one of a, a clear a clear example of uh, of some of the processes that you're talking about and and how these become uh, places for the the Jewish people in its entirety. So I'd like to ask you to, if you can, to explain a little bit about this process uh, of uh, you know of the specifics of of this case of of this neighborhood. Um, and then this, you know, why did it ignite the popular imagination? Uh, uh, sounds great. Let me start by showing some maps and let me focus uh, on this map. Historically, <coughs> sorry, I, I keep going to history, I'm a historian. Historically, uh, <coughs> Jerusalem was limited to the uh, walled area. This is the old city of Jerusalem as we see it. The wall around it is a historical wall in its current shape was built in the 16th century by the Ottomans. Uh, but in the 19th century, uh, you know, it became rather crowded. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> living conditions deteriorated. The population in, in increased in general all over the Ottoman world, including Jerusalem. So people started to move out of the city. Uh, those who are well-to-do started to move out of the city. And many moved out to this area here on the map. This will be west and southwest, rich uh, Palestinians started to move out and established a number of uh, more kind of modern neighborhoods with, uh, you know, uh, spacious areas, large streets. Uh, there were Jewish neighborhoods, the uh, earliest neighborhood outside of the wall was a, uh, an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood built in the middle of the 20th century, was uh, more or less in this area, which would be kind of west north of the city. And then there was uh, a gradually a, a expansion outside of the old city to the north. And this is where Sheikh Jarrah is located. Now, Sorry, let's... just to, to interrupt you, uh, the, this was uh, the Jewish uh, neighborhood in this western area, you said in the middle of the 20th century or 19th? 19th century, I meant 19th okay. Okay. Yeah, exactly. It's actually like uh, close to the 1840s or early 50s. I'm, I'm, I'm not certain right now of the date. Okay, let me move to another map. Uh, basically, uh, sorry, I need to uh, move this. Uh, okay, in 1967, uh, we have uh, a partition of the city. What we see here in blue is the area that fell to Israeli control. And from this area, we see Talbiya areas that I mentioned before, from which Palestinians were evicted and forced out. And the area here in uh, whatever kind of brownish uh, was the area under Jordanian control at the time. Now, in the uh, Within the area under Jordanian control, we have this area, I don't know if you can see my mouse, which was an Israeli zone. This is where the Hebrew University established in the mid 1920s was, or is, still is. And this is known as Mount Scopus or as uh, Jabal al-Musharif in Arabi or as Har uh, Hatsofim in Hebrew. 
according to the uh, armistice agreement between uh, Jordan and Israel, I think it was 1949, this area remained under Israeli control, which is an enclave within the Jordanian area, and uh, an agreement that will, there will be a convoy weekly coming from this area, let me expand it. This is the Mandelbaum Gate was the only uh, crossing point between the two parts of Jerusalem run by the UN. So weekly, a convoy will come from the area that is considered Israeli at that point to the Hebrew University, and I, I forgot, I think it was every Thursday or something like this. It will be protected by UN forces and Jordanian forces, and that convoy will go between the Israeli uh, enclave and West Jerusalem. And that convoy basically passed through Sheikh Jarrah. So Sheikh Jarrah, which is located in this area, was basically uh, the route through which uh, uh, you know, it is the connection or the area that, con uh, that provides the continuity between the uh, Jewish enclave or Israeli enclave and the rest of the Israeli uh, occupied territories in 1948. So therefore, Sheikh Jarrah by its location was very important. And since the occupation of 1967, and let me see if I can find, I have, uh, sorry, a number of images. Uh, to go back to my point, now, uh, since 1967, after the occupation, the first steps that the Israelis took were to build, uh, expand Jewish settlement, to ju Judaize the area around Sheikh Jarrah and around Jerusalem, and to make sure that that enclave is now completely connected through Jewish areas with West Jerusalem. So they first revived this co here called the French Hill, which was the first settlement to be built in, uh, immediately after the war, uh, which is exclusively Jewish area. They also expanded Ramat Ashkol, built Ramat Ashkol. So they basically uh, started building and separating the, making sure that the, uh, uh, you know, Israeli parts are well connected. This is also, uh, there was another plan, which is to make sure to, they expanded the borders of Jerusalem to start with. Uh, in doing so, they included uh, every, uh, they tried to, uh, to, to exclude, I'm sorry, exclude as many Palestinians as possible. So areas that were historically seen as part of Jerusalem were considered outside of Jerusalem, like Abu Dis here, El Aizariya, Sawahre, Anata, etc. And they immediately started to settle all around the city uh, in, in some sense to prevent the expansion of Palestinian areas. And so eventually the Palestinian areas uh, within the city were extremely <coughs> limited and attempts to uh, surround particularly the old city with settlements were taking place. And we have the case of the village of Silwan part of Jerusalem, in which the settlement started to, settlers started to take over homes. They uh, call it the city of David, and it's really contested, uh, and the situation is terrible there because they're taking one home after another, the same within the uh, old city itself. And now they have a plan to build here in this area, which we uh, call, uh, sorry, I cannot see the, uh, area, but more or less here they want to build a tech zone, which basically is a way to say we are taking over the land because, you know, they use all sorts of excuses to confiscate the land, remove the Palestinian residents, and then Judaize it. So now they're talking about some sort of Silicon Valley in Jerusalem. That's kind of the term they use. Now, Sheikh Jarrah, in, uh, in itself, which is uh, here, it's not very clear, but if you can see, it's here. Uh, before 1948, in this area, which was largely built by Palestinian non-Jews, I mean here, by uh, Palestinian rich elites, you know, the first to move to that area were the Hosseinis, you know, the, the kind of notables of, of Ottoman Palestine, and the Shashibis and others, these are important uh, kind of uh, notable uh, almost ruling feudal uh, families in Palestine at the time. 
but there, the, apparently in the late 19th century, a Jewish person or persons, I'm not sure, uh, rented a, an area in Sheikh Jarrah, which is around here. And in that area, uh, the rent was one of those contracts for 90 years, uh, which gives them the right to stay there for 90 years. Uh, so it's not property and it's rent. And those Jews, of course, we're talking 19th century. So we cannot even say they were Zionists. They were coming to an area where they believe there is a holy site, a tomb of uh, Shamon uh, the Just or Simon the Just or Shamon Hasidic. Uh, and, uh, you know, historically they were always there, as we know through uh, Ottoman uh, Jerusalem, J Jewish celebrations at the site, a particular uh, Jewish holiday. Um, I can't recall right now which when. So in 1948, uh, the Jews living here left or were evacuated and went into West Jerusalem. And the area, uh, the, their uh, place of residence or the, uh, you know, were, were left. And the Jordanians basically took over this area. They also had some sort of equivalent to the Israeli uh, <coughs> Uh, sorry, what did we call it? The uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, absentee property uh, office, and they uh, in, 19, in the mid fifties, the United Nations uh, UNRWA, United Nations uh, Works and Refugee uh, or, uh, Organization for Palestine, which takes care of the Palestinian refugees, along with the Jordanian government. <clears throat> Uh, moved uh, uh, some Palestinian refugees into the area. These are refugees from the western part of the city and, and, and other areas, and they have their property there, which was confiscated by the Israelis. And the deal was that they will give up their right of return and the right to property in West Jerusalem and elsewhere, and will basically uh, be settled here and they will have property documents. So the home, the contested homes right now happen to be owned by those people who basically uh, lost everything and were granted this right. And the war in 1967 took place uh, before the official registration by the Jordanian government and the UNRWA of these locations in their names uh, took place. So from the beginning of the occupation, especially in the 1980s, there were attempts by uh, settler groups to say that these are Jewish homes and we need to reclaim them. Again, one of those fallacies that you have Jewish homes. It's not like the grandson is coming to say, this is my grandfather's house. Um, and basically the Israeli courts granted them the right to expel the uh, 50 some families. And this has been happening for a while. Families were expelled as early as the seventies. In the 1980s, a number of homes were taken over. Uh, a hotel was taken over in the 1990s called the Mons Copis Hotel in the area. The house of the former house of the Hajj Amin al Husseini was taken over. But this happens now massively in, in, on a large scale. And no one is paying any attention or supporting the Palestinians. The Israeli law is not on their side. The settlers are violently coming to kick them out from their homes with the protection of the Israeli army and the police and border police. Uh, the Palestinian Authority is too busy figuring out whatever they want to do. Jerusalem is not any longer, it doesn't, despite the rhetoric, it's not even a priority, has no presence there. The international or the Arab uh, Middle Eastern uh, conditions with the uh, uh, signing of uh, agreements between Emirates and Bahrain and others, you know, we are, uh, Israel is at high point and they feel they are, this is the right time to do that. So the spark came from basically the attempt to remove these people from their homes. There was a deadline given by the court and the Israeli settlers started to move in and push Palestinians out. And that's when the events in early May started. Sorry, I have a feeling I've been talking forever. Um, no, this is this is really great. But uh, yeah, I think in the interest of, of time, uh, I'll just kind of sort of uh, try to maybe ask you a concluding question in terms of uh, really from 
from here, uh, where do we, you know, wh where do you see this, this uprising uh, going, maybe in a few short words, uh, maybe uh, if you could say a few words on what kind of international response is needed. Um, uh, your, your sort of your thoughts of uh, kind of the, the future very quickly, if you, if you like. Uh, well, I am not a very hopeful person, unfortunately. I've, I've learned enough. <clears throat> Uh, that disappointments always are looming somewhere. But uh, this is the first time since 1948 when the Israeli attack or Zionist Israeli attack is touching every Palestinian in historic Palestine. The division between Palestinians inside Israel into Bedouins in the south and so-called Israeli Arabs in the Galilee and uh, Gazans uh, in, in the uh, Gaza Strip enclave and the Palestinian Authority residents and the Jerusalem residents, all these divisions would, and each group had its own issues to deal with. Uh, that all seem to disappear. Right now, the Zionist, extreme right-wing Zionists are attacking Palestinians everywhere. And for the first time, it's not just about the occupied territories or the besieged Gaza. It is about that, of course, but it's not just about that. It's also about the very presence of Palestinians in, in cities inside Israel, like Haifa, Jaffa, Lid, uh, the Galilee, and of course, in the south, in the Naqab, uh, we had uh, attempts to confiscate lands over uh, ongoing for the last 10 years, demolishing of villages, etc. So for the first time, the issue is back to its beginning, <clears throat> to the nature of the Zionist project regard, uh, in, in regards to the others. And no longer the, a, a, a two-state solution uh, is, is the solution. The, the, the major question here is the nature of this state that controls Palestine and rules over Palestine that is exclusively uh, Jewish that passed a law of nationality or that uh, Israel as the, the state of the Jewish people was affirmed in 2018, I think. Uh, so we, I think, are at a point where the entire discourse can be changed and returned to the core of the issue, which is do we have, do we want to have a state that is exclusively Jewish, that ex excludes all others, or do we want to have a just uh, more democratic solution where people can live together despite their religious or ethnic differences? in uh, equally within one state or two states or even 12 states, it doesn't matter. But basically uh, we are going back to, to the root cause of the problem. And I think this is the time when the Palestinians should uh, move and their supporters move particularly on this issue. Is it gonna happen so far? International uh, Arab Arab uh, official Arab positions are terrible. They're even worse than the European positions. Even worse in some cases than the U.S. positions. Uh, the U.N. is uh, affirming the two-state solution. The danger. It, all of a sudden, the problem seems to be internationally that oh no, the proposed two-state solution is in danger. As if the problem really was that we're trying to save this idea of the two-state solution. Fine, I'm not against two states or one state, but, but what matters is what kinds of states do we want to have. And if we manage to uh, uh, capitalize on this and once again change the discourse to what it used to be up to the uh, 1948 war and the Nakba, uh, then we have a golden opportunity, at least. I'm not saying we're going to win, uh, Palestine is going to li be liberated, but at least the international and the national discourse will be changed. Of course, there are dangers that the, the Zionists and their supporters are not going to like that. But also we have Islamists are not going to like that. You know, we have all sorts of obstacles. But I think at the end of the day, we are going back to this point, and I hope we manage to capitalize on that.